Okay, uh, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining uh, this webinar. My name is Melissa Miklas. I am a communication officer at FEDERN, the European Federation of Agencies and Regions for Energy and the Environment. And FEDERN is also the communication leader of the Green Island project, which you will hear about in a bit. Um, we, we hosted a webinar last year, the first one of the project, uh, on the decarbonization of uh, islands using green hydrogen. And one of the conclusions of this uh, webinar was that it would be very useful to hear more about uh, how to decarbonize the maritime sector, uh, which is why I'm hosted, hosting this webinar today. And I also reached out to our sister project, H2 Ports, um, which you will also hear about. Um, so I'm very pleased that they agreed to, uh, to co-host the webinar today. Thank you, Aurelio, um, for being here. Um, I want to maybe start by a little introduction um, to make sure you're all with us listening before diving into uh, the actual content. Um, so this is the program of the day in case you didn't get all the emails. So a lot of great speakers today with us. We, we will have five presentations and you will get time for questions uh, between all of these and at the end. Uh, but before that, please uh, join us on Slido. Uh, I already uh, put something in, in there to, to help you. But uh, so for Slido, you can either uh, use the QR code there. You should also have received a, a link um, that you can use on your phone or tablet, ideally not the computer if you're on the computer. Um, and this will help us build this word cloud. So the question is, what is the biggest challenge, according to you, to decarbonize the maritime sector at the moment? This should help us trigger discussions and reflection for this webinar right now. I already answered, so I won't do it. Okay, thank you for being so active and already on Slido early in the morning for some of you. Financing, as always, some ag agree with me, technology readiness. I'll wait a bit longer because I see some of you are typing. Very few, you'll hear about that later. Okay. Very good. Thank you so much for your answers. Uh, this was just to make sure you were with us awake. Uh, but now uh, I would like to uh, introduce our first speaker. Uh, I'm very glad that we have today uh, Peter Crowley, Policy Officer at DG Research and Innovation in the European Commission. Uh, responsible for waterborne transport in the unit low emission future industries. Uh, so, Peter, uh, thank you so much. You have the floor and you can share uh, the screen. Good morning, uh, everybody. And can I ask, can you, can you see my screen? And, uh, okay, Melissa. You have to, no, you have to share. We don't see it yet. Okay, okay. Screen three, share. And now? Perfect. Yes, that's good. Okay, I'm uh, not as uh, slick as some people with the, with these um, tools. So I just like to give well to introduce myself. I'm Peter Crawley from DG RTD, and I'm responsible for the waterborne uh, research uh, program uh, together with uh, colleagues in uh, our unit, which is misleadingly titled low emission future industries because it also includes aviation and uh, coal and steel so other heavy uh, industries 
So first of all, I'll just give you, um, let's, uh, just to check, yeah. I'll just give you some uh, context of uh, where we are. So the EU has set a very um, ambitious program to, um, to decarbonize its economy. And this has been set out in the European uh, Green Deal. Uh, which is a view, vision for a sustainable, uh, low-carbon economy where nobody is uh, left behind. Um, and in July 21, there was the introduction of the EU climate law, which enshri enshrined the objective of becoming climate neutral by 2050, with an intermediate target of a 55% reduction by 2030 compared to 1990 levels. So if you look at the uh, graph there, you can see where we need to be and uh, where we are. And you can also see that transport actually is not really declining in terms of uh, uh, carbon emissions. Concerning the maritime uh, sector, well, concerning all sectors, and I'll come from maritime, there was a legislative package called the Fit for 55 package, which was uh, launched in July this year, which includes um, a basket of legislation, including for, uh, for maritime transport. So if we look a little bit more in Fit for 55 and see what we have, there, there's a raft of measures which are there to uh, create the market conditions towards positive choices for uh, sustainable, uh, zero carbon, uh, waterborne transport, we say, because we include inland uh, waterway transport as well as uh, maritime transport. So, for example, there is the extension of the emissions trading scheme to include uh, maritime uh, transport, uh, revision of the alternative fuel infrastructure directive, which I understand is going to be a regulation uh, in future with, for example, uh, stronger requirements concerning the use of plug-in power for uh, vessels in ports. Uh, there is a new fuel EU maritime regulation, which will have incentives and increasingly tough targets uh, for the take-up of sustainable uh, low-carbon uh, fuels as well as the Energy Taxation Directive, revisions of the Renewable Energy Directive. So those are in a way a little bit like the sticks um, to drive uh, the maritime sector towards positive choices, towards uh, decarbonizing. And they're applying to shipping within the uh, European region, as well as uh, towards international shipping uh, entering the European uh, region. But also there are complementary uh, measures, uh, which are more like uh, the carrots as such, to uh, improve the uh, technology readiness to bring the solutions to market. So for example, concerning R&I, um, our area, uh, we have Horizon Europe and particularly a new zero emission waterborne transport partnership, which I'll remember, I'll mention later. Uh, and also we have uh, measures supporting deployments of new innovative uh, solutions, avoiding this valley of death after r &I actions. So for example, there is the Climate Change Innovation Fund and the Connecting Europe facility. So coming to Horizon Europe, so for those of you who are not uh, familiar, uh, Horizon Europe is the world's largest collaborative uh, R&I program, almost 100 billion uh, euros covering um, every area you could possibly uh, imagine from 20, 2021 to 2027. Um, you will find uh, most RI addressing uh, waterborne transport within cluster five, which is this climate, energy, and mobility cluster. And you will see there is a work program available online, which has more details what our program is. 
and you will find waterborne transport uh, there. So what are we doing um, in Horizon Europe to decarbonize uh, waterborne transport? A major new initiative uh, that we have in Horizon Europe because we've really stepped up activities towards decarbonization of waterborne transport. I think it's fair to say that previously the focus has been on cutting pollution from waterborne transport, um, but now, of course, as well as cutting pollution, we're looking at uh, decarbonization and, and solutions are not always the same. And a new initiative is we have launched a zero emission waterborne transport partnership uh, within the industry. It's what we call a co-programmed partnership, which means it's implemented through Horizon Europe, but programmed um, in partnership with um, the industry side who have a strategic research and innovation agenda uh, of the activities that need to be addressed to, uh, to decarbonize sec the sector. So I've given a link there to the website you can find, but there's an impressive membership, almost all of the main players in Europe. Um, the EU has committed 530 million towards this uh, partnership and the industrial partners have committed an in-kind commitment of over 3 billion euros in complementary activities which are aligned with the objectives of the partnership which is to achieve deployable zero emission solutions suitable for all main ship types by 2030. I can see a mistake on a missing text on the last bullet on my slide but outside of the uh, of the partnership we have around 100 million uh, euros on activities that are not directly related to uh, decarbonization. So these are things like digitalization, automation, or activities that support the competitiveness of the uh, waterborne transport sector. So um, yeah, so this is the main objectives of the partnership, which is using R&I to develop and demonstrate zero emission solutions for all main ship types and services by 2030, which will enable zero emission waterborne transport by 2050. So within that, um, it is addressing the elimination of greenhouse gas emissions from new ships and retrofits, so of existing ships to accelerate the deployment of these technologies. Um, by means of sustainable climate neutral fuels, renewable energies, electrification and energy efficiency. All of these things go hand in hand. Um, cutting coastal and inland pollution to air by at least 50% compared to uh, current levels. Elimination of pollution to water, including underwater noise from ships. And if you look at their strategic research and innovation agenda, you will see all of the, uh, well, we all know the main sort of technologies uh, there. So boosting the use of sustainable alternative fuels, you know, what is the scenarios for the rollout of these fuels? There's a variety, you know, um, it was mentioned in the, uh, in the point at the beginning, um, the, the availability of these fuels. So what's the scenario for them arriving? Um, how we, and what is their cost? How are we going to use this fuel on board? Some of these are more challenging, like ammonia and hydrogen. You know, what are the power conversion technologies that we need? And this will result in demonstrators. Also, there is electrification. This is not just uh, pure 100% battery electrification, but it can also include uh, ICE combustion engine um, electric uh, drives, which can be more uh, efficient. Um, and there you've got storage, grid, electric, uh, you know, a ho whole range of technologies. For energy efficiency, there's a range of solutions there. Addressing both the design of new build ships and retrofitting, how to manufacture them. Digitalization, but not digitalization for no purpose, digitalization for greening and ports, which is probably particularly interesting for your cells, where 
in the partnership, they're particularly looking at the interface between the port and the ship. So, you know, the bunkering of sustainable alternative fuels. Again, this is more challenging for some of the candidate fuels than uh, other types. Recharging solutions, and this includes um, connection to electric supplies in ports and reducing, uh, reducing emissions in the port area. So this is this uh, partnership, which is implemented through the Horizon Europe work program. So it's not what we call a joint undertaking, which runs, effect, a joint undertaking runs effectively as a mini agency. It has its own staff finance and is placing contracts uh, directly. A co-programmed partnership, the, um, the topics arising from the partnership are published within the Horizon Europe work program and are uh, evaluated and applications are evaluated and are supported in the usual way through the Horizon Europe uh, measures. Okay, so the two uh, partnerships which have closer synergies to Waterborne is the Clean Hydrogen Joint Undertaking, which is uh, addressing the supply of green hydrogen as well as large-scale demonstration of hydrogen fuel cell propelled inland waterways, uh, large uh, hydrogen containment for shipping, you know, for shipping high liquid hydrogen around the world as a fuel, um, and some linked uh, topics, you know, we can think of um, technology uh, for in expanding the size of uh, and capability of fuel cells so that these are capable of being a primary power source for ships. And then also we have the co-program partnership on batteries. Batteries for shipping and for ferries is accelerating very rapidly. The costs are coming down. Uh, there are exciting developments. Uh, there I see you have e-ferry in the program later. They have... Uh, it's, also arising from a Horizon 2020 project, and they have shown uh, what you can do and that boundary is progressing all the time. So looking forward next, and I'm looking at my time a little bit. Um, so we have completed the work program 2021-22, the work program for 23-24, has been through the different stages of consultation. It is really now with a final draft, which is with member states uh, for adoption. Um, we're expecting publication actually the beginning of December. Uh, there will be an info day, 15th to 16th of December. We're expecting the calls, first call to be open from the 2nd of December to the 20th of April. Uh, next year. And of course, I, I cannot say in detail anything that might be in this uh, work program, though googling around you might find some documents, I should say, take some caution when you're looking at these uh, things, because we don't know how, how they've arisen at what stage of the discussion they are. But the type of things you might see in the first part are things like power conversion technology. So this is converting the uh, energy in the fuel or the, um, to the uh, power for the propeller. There's a range of different technologies demonstrating the use of uh, new sustainable fuels meeting the uh, some of the more ambitious targets in the fuel EU maritime uh, regulation, you know, how to better optimize navigation and port calls, which, for example, support slow steaming to arrive at uh, ports, also enable ports to better schedule their, their traffic, but ships can also anticipate their arrival, so they're not rushing to arrive and then an anchor offshore for uh, hours or days. Um, also, provision of clean power for ships, you know, uh, for ships at more than the key, this is already known, but how do we provide clean power for ships that are actually anchor, at anchor in the port region? Uh, you know, greener shipbuilding, automated, using automation to move more by water, and then sort of looking maybe a little bit the next uh, step, you have things like 
high voltage power and DC electric grid. So this is all about using electrification better on ships, having it more integrated and more uh, efficient. Um, retrofitting to meet the Fit for 55 targets, which are the ones coming uh, sooner, cutting underwater noise, you know, digitalization to make greener ships, how to have business models that um, support uh, innovation. So uh, some of the chartering arrangements now don't support, uh, don't reward the users of shipping from having lower emission uh, ships. Uh, better combining national activities and having syn better synergies with the activities of the partnership. Um, and also looking at air pollution from shipping, you know, what is the harm to human uh, health there? So my last slide, which I won't go through, uh, but you'll have in the, uh, when the slides are circulated, there's a whole range of links there to the things that I've mentioned. And also lastly, where you can find uh, support and uh, help. And sorry, uh, I think I've got five minutes over time, Melissa. Thank you, Peter. That was uh, certainly interesting for, for me and uh, to learn about the ambitious targets planned and, uh, and how to reach them. Uh, we actually have two questions for you. Uh, in the end, can you stay with us a bit longer, Peter, to inform yes, participants? Can, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, in case there are more questions, uh, our audience can know that they can still ask you uh, at the end. But we already have two questions, as I said. Uh, Patrick Crayan would like to know: Can uh, co-programming involve non-EU government agencies in countries with which we have association agreements, for example? Well, the co-programming is with it's not with national agencies okay um, it's with the private side however there is a, a member state coordination group uh, with the uh, partnership uh, where member states and associated states can nominate uh, national representatives so, you know, all of the associated states are involved uh, there, um, but we ask for the attendees to be nominated by the program committee member from that country, but within the partnership uh, as a whole, um, yes, uh, it is open to the entire sector from Europe, so from the associated and member states, um, but not, it's not intended for like funding agencies uh, from the different um, uh, countries. Very good. And uh, my boss, Dominique Borges, would like to know what is the average support for uh, all the type of supports that you presented in the slide before? Oh, that's a very good question, a very hard one to give an answer to. Well, no, no project is less than 5 million, okay? Um, we have some topics uh, coming up, we, which the largest is 30 million for the project. Okay, uh, for, no, actually it's, it's th over 30 million for the topic. For the projects, they're not usually over 10 to 15 uh, million as, as, as a maximum. In terms of the level of support, uh, it's where well, it depends on the type of action for for research and innovation action. It can be up to 100% of indirect costs for uh, non-profit uh, organisations, for example. Uh, for the res for the innovation actions, which are sort of closest to the market, it can be 60%, uh, uh, for example, for uh, private entities if you go to if you follow up some of the links that i have there you you can find the full full details perfect thank you so much peter uh we'll see okay. you in a bit okay cool thank now, you very much it's time to introduce uh, our second speaker angela sanchez uh from inagas she's our green island project coordinator she studied chemical engineering and specialized on renewable energies. And since she started her professional career, she has been 
uh, working on the carbonization projects, especially those related with green hydrogen developments. So the perfect person to speak about Green Island. Angela, you have the floor. Thank you very much. It's your slides. Melissa, for such a great introduction. Thank you very much for attending to the webinar. I'm going, as mentioned by Melissa, I'm going to introduce the Green Highland project. This initiative started with an agreement between the Ministry of Industry, Trade and Tourism and the Balearic government with Enagas, Actiona, Femex and Redexis to reindustrialize Yoseta in Mallorca due to the closure of the cement plant, cement plant owned by Femex. Since the beginning, private and public cooperation started to mitigate the impact of the closure and look for a, a solution to boost the decarbonization. This project covers the whole value chain, or chain sorry, of green hydrogen from the production to the consumption and distribution. And in 2019, the Balearic government approved the project as a, the strategic industrial project which was a really great new in terms of support. This project will deliver the first fully functioning hydrogen ecosystem on the Mediterranean, as this concept can be replicated in other islands and isolated territories. Mallorca is a great showcase for this kind of project, as it receives tourists for, from all the world. In 2018, it received almost uh, 12 million tourists. So um, uh, here you can see the, the uh, schematic of the project. Um, this uh, project uh, has uh, two PV parks of new construction located in Joseta and Petra. And those will supply energy to the hydrogen production plant located on Semex land. And uh, it has already been built and was inaugurated in March of this year. The plant will produce uh, three, uh, 330 tons per year, uh, which will be distributed by tube trailers to the end users or injected into the hydrogen dedicated pipeline, which is also deployed within the project scope. It will be uh, afterwards blended into the uh, in existing natural gas grid of the island. Regarding the end users at the EMT, a dual hydrogen refueling station will be installed to refuel at least five hydrogen buses and a fleet of 10 hydrogen uh, vehicles, rental cars. And there's also contemplated the installation of three hydrogen fuel cells, which will be installed in the first one uh, of 25 kilowatts fuel cell at an sports center in the municipality of Joseta. Another one is a 70 kilowatts fuel cell, which will be installed in the hotel, in a hotel in Palma. And the last one is a 100 kilowatt fuel cell, which will be installed in the port of Palma to supply electricity for critical infrastructure at the port of Palma. Uh, it will consume uh, 40 tons per year of green hydrogen, avoiding 470 tons per year of uh, CO2 emissions. The port authority, uh, of Palma is a public entity that depends on the Ministry of Transport. Um, um, the uh, EM4, the maritime station number four, will expand itself approximately uh, 30%. They contemplate to install 100 kilowatts of photovoltaic uh, solar panels. And we are going to install a, a, the dimensioned 100 kilowatts fuel cell. In the event of surplus of energy at the EM4, it will be discharged to the other uh, nearby uh, stations, such as EM2 and 1, which you can see on the image on the, on the left, sorry. And regarding the site layout and preliminary engineering design, they've already been done. Uh, uh, from the point of view of security, this station is considerable, considered a vulnerable element because, as you can see on this schematic on the right, there's the passarella for the passengers uh, uh, getting to the port. 
so is this one you can see on on the right and uh, there's some considerations will be, which will be taken into account such as discharging hydrogen during low operation hours of the port you can see on on the image on the left we have in yellow the further station of the maritime station. We have in blue uh, the actual uh, surface of the of the EM4 where the solar panels will be installed, and we have on the right the area where the hundred kilowatt fuel cell will be installed. Here you can see how will be this process be carried out. The hydrogen tube, uh, the tube trailer will arrive through the point five and will enter the, the area, making the discharge of hydrogen through the hydrogen discharge panel. And uh, you can see um, the hazardous areas marked in, in red, while, while um, the maintenance area is in, or in orange and the perimeter of all the installation is um, marked in green. Here you have the control of the battery with a PLC via ethernet cable to the communication room of the maritime station in case you're, you, you'd like to um, replicate this concept, uh, this may be really useful. And regarding the capex of the whole uh, uh, deployment, it's um, uh, approximately 800,000 uh, euros with delivery times in total of uh, 14 months. Regarding the high, uh, Green Island project, there will be parallel studies uh, carried out within the scope. The first one is the study on the decarbonization of the seafarer stations at the ports of Mallorca, Ibiza, and Menorca. The study will uh, include how the renewable energies integration into the um, uh, production of green hydrogen and its storage to be used in fuel cells could contribute to the decarbonization of those various stations studied. And regarding the last study, it will be on the development of cold ironing at the port of Palma. It will be based on the techno-economic assessment to the use of fuel cells for cold ironing and in the port of Ma uh, in Mallorca. Regarding the mentioned replication potential of this project, we have a consortium of 30 partners from uh, countries of the European Union together with Chile and Morocco. And we have seven follower territories which will uh, try to replicate this concept on their territories. You can see on the uh, right, we have the, the observers. Those are uh, in, um, bodies that are not partners of the project but they uh, were interested in following the project very close to try to replicate it in their territories. And they, we have uh, more than 20 letters of support from, from those observers. If you want to become one of them, you can send us an email and we will uh, send you the information. You'll be able to use some of the tools which are being developed within the project, such as the Hydrogen Territories platform for the replication studies that our follower territories are carrying out to make their replication. And as a closure, I, want, I would like to uh, highlight some key figures such as the 15 megawatts of uh, solar panels installed uh, of new creation for this project. When this project is in full operation, it will avoid uh, 20, 21,000 tons per year of CO2 emissions. And the total investment for this development is 50 million euro. We have received from the Clean Hydrogen Partnership 10 million euros, while the Institute for Diversification has uh, given 2.5 million for the uh, construction of the PV plants. Thank you very much. And you can contact us for anything you, you may be interested in too. 
Thank you so much, Angela, for this uh, great presentation of Green Island. Uh, I will put uh, more links here if you want to follow the project, uh, join uh, our LinkedIn group, follow follow maybe it, our newsletter, because yeah, I think there will be more webinars uh, about the replication side of the project. We're definitely working on it. Uh, I would also like to uh, to thank Araceli Gutierrez from the port um, of uh, Palma, who contributed to this presentation, Araceli, if you, if you're, I think you're here. Um, if you would like to turn on the webcam to contribute to the Q and A, you're more than welcome. Uh, I see there are two questions uh, already now uh, that we can uh, share. Uh, one from Peter, uh, our first speaker. Um, so. The question is, uh, which is the worst case scenario for the risk analysis, uh, such as uh, the size of uh, the explosion, uh, et cetera? Um, do you want me to re uh, answer the question, Araceli? Yes, if you can. Uh, okay. Uh, we, we have developed the, the uh, studies for the hazardous area. Oh, we had some issues. Um, well, uh, we, we've we made the hazardous studies. So uh, uh, there's some walls which have been um, uh, built or well, will be built uh, because they, they're not uh, uh, there yet. And there's been, you can see here, the parameters which have been considered. So the worst scenario in case of explosion, that would be uh, the loss of all the uh, capex and all the facilities already displayed there. But as it will be operating during low operation hours, there wouldn't be much people there and there will be installed uh, retaining walls uh, in case of overpressure. So the worst case, uh, it would be the loss of the facilities. You can see on this picture, the expansion of the area also, this won't be the sea, this is currently built and the fuel cell would be kind of isolated because there's no uh, passengers crossing around and no people in this area, this is storage, so. I hope I have answered your question. Very good, I think you did, thank you. And there was a second qu question from another Peter. Uh, P First Peter says, thank you. And second Peter, Peter Yates uh, asked, what detection systems do you have in place? Um, okay, we, we haven't installed them yet, but we will have detectors of hydrogen uh, emissions and of course, the ones uh, controlling the pressure. We have also uh, the PLC, which uh, in which you can see how the control of all the system will be carried out. We haven't done yet the detailed engineering. So uh, at the point we are right now, I can confirm we will have hydrogen detectors and pressure detectors, but at this stage, we don't have much uh, Deeper. Uh, let's see if we have a, okay. One last question. Uh, could you could you give more details regarding the hydrogen generation unit? And then we'll have to move on. Okay, the hydrogen generation unit uh, is already um, built. Uh, it, at this stage, it's a two point five megawatt electrolyzer. It's PEM electrolyzer because it's more. Uh, environmental friendly as it doesn't use a KOH uh, solution. And at this stage, the oxygen produced will be vented. But as far as we find uh, some uh, possibility to give value to that uh, oxygen produced, we, we will um, uh, sail it or take advantage of it. So at this stage, uh, oxygen will be vented, hydrogen will be uh, produced uh, at the first stage uh, in, of the project, uh, 330 tons, which will be uh, produced at 30 bar and will be compressed by a compressor delivered by Hyperbaric up to 330 bars. 
pressure uh, uh, of transport by the tube trailers. We have two, three tube tra trailers, which, we, which will be charged with high 500 kilograms of hydrogen each. Okay. Um, so before we move on to the next speaker, um, we had actually a, a quick quiz that we prepared with Angela. Um, you just had the, the answer in front of your eyes uh, a few seconds ago. So if you can join the quiz now, and then you will see the question appearing. Okay, thank you. We have some people. Let's see the question. So the question is, what is the capacity of the fuel cell to be installed in the port of Palma? Is it 100 kilowatts? 120 kilowatts, 150 or 200. I'll give you a few seconds, but you'll have to be fast because it's time to move on. There will be another Slido question just after, though, because uh, Aurelio, our next speaker, wanted to introduce his presentation with uh, also one. So stay with us here. OK, let's see if you paid attention. Very good, Angela. <laughs> you managed to, to have the audience with you. So thank you again for this great presentation. Thank you, everyone, for paying such great attention. <laughs> Thank you. So, um, oops, sorry about that. So I will um, already introduce Aurelio. Um, Aurelio Lazzaro is uh, currently working at the uh, Environmental St Sustainability and Energy Transition Department at Fundación Valencia Port. He holds a PhD uh, in industrial engineering and his background merges experience in hydrogen technologies and energy markets. He's the speaker who will uh, tell about H2 ports. So welcome Aurelio. Let's see the question that you prepared. Thank you, Melissa. Uh, thank you for organizing this event and inviting us to, to present our project. With pleasure. So the question that Aurelio would like you to to answer is where are we going to see the first transition to hydrogen in the maritime industry? Port inland applications powered with green hydrogen or hydrogen or hydrogen derived green fuels for vessels. Of course, the two are addressed in this webinar. It's there is no right or wrong. Do you agree with the results, Aurelio? <laughs> yeah, I, I actually uh, ask this question because normally we tend to think that uh, hydrogen will arrive to the maritime sector uh, through fuel or even a commodity that uh, is going to be shipped. But I'm glad that the audience is already aware that uh, there is another option that uh, is to use the hydrogen directly in port operations as uh, its support is, is trying to demonstrate. Okay, well, the audience is already agreeing with you, so you can yeah. uh, you can go ahead. <laughs> Perfect. I'm going to share my screen. Perfect. Can you see my? Okay. Yes. Okay. Perfect. Uh, first, I would like to introduce very brief, briefly uh, Fundación Valencia Port, this uh, the institution where I work. Uh, Fundación Valencia Port is a non-profit organization that provides uh, scientific services to the Valencian Port uh, Authority. I work in the, the sustainability and energy transition department, but additionally, uh, Fundación Valencia Port has also competences in other aspects related with the port environment, such as uh, digitalization, uh, such as integrating the port with the city, by uh, acting as a link between the port and the universities, companies, startups. And uh, 
yeah, we, uh, as, as I said, we are very related with uh, the Port Authority of, of Valencia that uh, manages uh, the port of Valencia and two additional ports, Port of Zaguanto, that is uh, a bit in the north of, of Valencia, uh, a smaller port, and also Port of Gandia, a bit in the south. Uh, port of Valencia is the biggest port that uh, the, author, the Valencian Port Authority uh, manages and is actually the fourth uh, biggest port in, in Europe and the busiest port of Spain and in the entire Mediterranean. It's uh, mostly a container uh, traffic uh, port, uh, but uh, we also uh, have a, a Roro uh, terminal, uh, a liquid pool terminal, of course, and we also have some passenger uh, transit. Um, this is where H2 Ports project uh, takes place. Uh, H2 Ports project is going to be the first application of hydrogen in ports operation. And we are going to do it uh, by uh, developing and testing two uh, machines that uh, uh, are a rich stacker that is going to be uh, tested in the MC, uh, MCC terminal. Here you can see it in the, in the left side. And in the right side, you can see here the Grimaldi Roro terminal that is going to test a jar factor that uh, is also being developed in the project. Uh, these machines are not going to, to go out from, from the, the terminals, uh, so the hydrogen should get in. And for that reason, the, the project uh, also considers a mobile hydrogen refueling uh, system that will go to the terminals and refuel the devices. Uh, the total budget of the project is uh, 4 million euros and has been uh, fully supported by the SCH joint undertaking uh, in 2009. Uh, these are the partners that uh, uh, we are working together to make uh, this project uh, come through. Uh, it is coordinated by us, the Fundación Valencia Port. Also, there is a direct uh, participation from the Valencia Port Authority. Uh, the industry is very well represented with uh, uh, this, uh, these companies that you can see here. Easter Jail is the developer of the, of the Rich Stacker. It's an American company uh, that is uh, leading uh, this, this sector. And is participating in the project with the uh, Dutch and German uh, uh, subsidiaries. Uh, Ballard uh, is a policy uh, provider. Uh, it's a Canadian company that is, again, is, is participating in the, the company through its European uh, uh, branch. E Carburos Metallicos is the hydrogen provider of the project that uh, belongs to Air Products Group. And in a gas that is the, the Spanish uh, gas TSO, that as you have seen in the previous presentation, they have a lot of experience in both hydrogen and also providing uh, gases to, to port areas. Additionally, I would like to, to mention two other uh, type of institutions that are participating in the, in the project. Uh, we have also research institutions like the Spanish National uh, Research Center for Hydrogen, Centro Nacional del Hidrógeno and also Athena Group, so that is a, an Italian, uh, Italian institution uh, related with uh, NEA uh, for performing also research. Uh, and the, in my opinion, the most important group are the end users. If we don't have end users, we cannot, uh, we cannot think about uh, uh, using hydrogen uh, anywhere. And these end users in our case are MC Terminal and Green Marty Terminal that are the ones that are going to, to, to try these, these machines in their, in their own daily operations. And, and we are very glad to have them on board. Okay, this is the project structure. Uh, then we have three technical work packages that are uh, work packages two, three and four that are developing the, the three main parts of, the, of this puzzle. That is the, the hydrogen refueling system and the rich stacker and the terminal tractor. 
we have an additional work package that is covering cross-cutting aspects of the project, uh, such as the risk management and the uptake strategy. And we have additional work packages uh, uh, to manage the project itself and to deal with the communication and dissemination parts that are also uh, very important. I'm going to just focus on the technical work packages. Work package number two is uh, dealing to develop this uh, hydrogen uh, supply system. As I said before, we need a mobile part to uh, reach uh, the, the machines that are on the terminals. But uh, we have also a fixed part of this uh, hydrogen refuel system. The fixed uh, part is composed by a buffer tank that is going to uh, store the hydrogen that is supplied by truck by Carburos uh, Metallicos. Uh, we have a buffer tank that is uh, able to store up to 118 kilos of uh, hydrogen in a pressure that ranges from 10 to 40 bar. And also the fixed part has also uh, a compressor station that is able to increase the pressure of hydrogen into two levels, uh, 300 bars and 450 bars. Uh, why that? Uh, the machines are working uh, with uh, 350 bars and are going to be uh, loaded by difference of pressure with the mobile unit. So we need to increase uh, the, the pressure of the, of the mobile unit above these 350 bars. And we have decided to do it in a two stage for energy efficient uh, uh, reasons. And this uh, hydrogen refueling system is developed by the National Hydrogen Center, Centro Nacional de Hidrógeno, and also with a direct participation of uh, Carburos uh, Metallicos. Uh, currently, the fixed part is already finished and is in place here in the port of Valencia, and we expect to receive the mobile unit uh, during the next month. Uh, once uh, we have it here, this mobile unit will be able to store up to 60 kilos of hydrogen. The hydrogen flow that is able to reach is about 3.6 kilos per minute. So we can expect to, to that the refueling process takes between 10 and 15 minutes in, in each of the, of the, of the machines. Uh, work package three is focused on developing the rich stacker. I said before, is a development done by Haster Jail in the in the Netherlands. Um, it, this this is this machine is, has been designed and built from scratch uh, to use hydrogen as a as a, as a food supply. Uh, we can see here in the right side, for instance, the, the deposit of, of of hydrogen that uh, are located on this part. Oops, sorry, I was trying to highlight this. In the, in the right part of the, of the machine, you can see the deposit of hydrogen. And additionally, it's powered with, uh, uh, with two fuel cells uh, developed by the company Nuvera that actually belongs to Eister Jail of uh, 45 kilowatts each. So the total power of the, of the fuel cell group is uh, 19 kilowatts. And uh, the device is currently, the machine is currently uh, finishing. I am actually refreshing the email from time to time because we expect that uh, within this week, uh, the machine will be completely finished. And we expect to, to receive uh, this machine in the MC terminal by next month, by November uh, this year. Uh, work package number four uh, deals with the terminal uh, tractor. Uh, this is developing, this, this machine is being developed by uh, Athena uh, with, uh, with the collaboration of, of Ballard, as is the provider of the fuel cell. Uh, the fuel cell in this case is a 70 kilowatts uh, 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 model of, of Ballard that has been adapted to, to the thermal in this case, it's not. It's a retrofitting from a diesel uh, machine, and this has been a really a challenge because the the inner spaces are not uh, thought to 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 integrate a uh, hydrogen fueled uh, system. So the space were really limited, and in some cases, they they really had to to go through an entire uh, redesign of some parts of this of this thermal sector to. Being able to integrate 
the, the hydrogen devices. Uh, as I said before, there is an additional work packages dealing with market uh, strategy and risk management. Uh, we have also gone through the, regul the current regulatory situation to be sure that uh, we uh, obey the, the, the current uh, legislation framework. And uh, we are going to also evaluate the techno-economic uh, feasibility of uh, uh, integrating this uh, hydrogen full machinery for port operations in a, in a daily basis. What the priority We have here the current uh, if the port uh, planning. I say current because it has been uh, has been uh, modified from the original uh, submission. Well, the reason is because this 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 project has uh, gone through a pandemic and also a sustained chain crisis that has affected a lot the, this this first uh, first part of the project. Uh, but uh, we think that the that the worst is is over, and we are starting now uh, the the nicest part of the project that uh, will come when the when the machines are here in the port, and we start the two years uh, piloting uh, uh, period that is going to start in the month of December January, and in that period we are going to try both the machines in the terminals for. Uh, years and for uh, 5,000 hours of operation each to see how these uh, uh, hydrogen fueled uh, machines uh, deal with a day-by-day -day operation in a, in a port uh, environment. Uh, my last slide is an invitation you, uh, for you to follow our, our, our uh, uh, web page and uh, LinkedIn profiles. We're very active in showing uh, you how the, the different um, developments in the in the project and in the future we are going to to update very uh, in a regular basis uh, to to keep you updated in these uh, new states uh, where where when we are going to try the machines in real so we are going to have very visual and touchable results i invite you all to to follow on, uh, on communities um thank you very much thank you so much aurelio uh, it's very nice to see uh, it's two examples of green hydrogen projects in the same country, yet it's very different. Uh, so very nice. Uh, we have a question already uh, from uh, George Kaplanis, who would like to know uh, if uh, you have green hydrogen guarantees for the hydrogen stored on the mobile unit, as well as the hydrogen produced by the electrolysis unit, if any. Warranties, you mean like a green hydrogen warranties? Yes. Uh, we are not obliged in the project to use uh, green hydrogen, even that we are uh, using it as the our provider, Carburos, is, uh, is producing this hydrogen from renewable energy, even though we are not requested to provide any kind of certificate because it was not part of the, of the project. Okay, very good clear uh okay uh i believe for now that's it but of course there will be again time for question at the end so uh thank you so much uh aurelio uh, so now uh that's it for uh port uh, applications um before moving on to our uh, ferries best practices i have again a little um slido question for you guys uh so i will share my screen and please connect to Slido. Um, get ready. <laughs> so this is from Eurostat. Uh, how many passengers uh, do you think embarked and disembarked in uh, EU ports in 2020? Well, this is still talking about ports, uh, but uh, well, to embark and disembark, you need ferries, uh, hence. Uh, so 120 million, do you think? 150, 180, or 230 million passengers? What do you think? In 2020, uh, this is a uh, pandemic year. I'll give you a minute to think about this. I know it's a hard question.
Okay, I think we can give you the answer. Okay, you think it's 180? It was 230, so, <laughs> but close enough, let's say. Uh, all right, uh, time to welcome um, Annie Cord Cortzari, sorry about <laughs> my pronunciation. Uh, Annie is uh, head of the Railway Laboratory um, of the Hellenic Institute of Transport with a research experience of more than 15 years in the field of transport. During the eFerry project, she acted as the impact manager responsible for all dissemination actions and for the formulation of the first business plan. And eFerry, it's a bit of a change because it's not about fuel cell and hydrogen te technologies anymore. So uh, Annie, thank you for being here and you have the floor. Hello, good morning, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. We can see your slides, not in full screen yet. I think now you can. Yes, perfect. Okay. So uh, my presentation today is about Ellen, uh, the 100% electric ferry traveling in ranges never seen before. Uh, this was the outcome of uh, the e-ferry project funded by the European Commission. Um, okay, doesn't seem to work. Okay, so a brief history of the ferry project. Uh, everything started in 2013 when uh, local marines in the island of Ara in Denmark decided to, to build a fully electric emission-free ferry to replace the aging diesel ferry that was uh, on route back then. Um, uh, in 2014, they had the feasibility study ready named Green Ferry Vision. Uh, with the goal to have a vessel that uh, would cover unprecedented range for an electric ferry with no fossil fuels and no emergency backup systems. So uh, after this feasibility study in 2015, the e-ferry project was uh, funded by the European Commission. So the actual building of the ferry started. So uh, eFerry was a project, as we said, funded by the Commission, uh, involving, involving the design, building, and demonstration of a fully electric part green ferry medium-sized for uh, medium-range connections. Uh, it started in June 2015. The initial duration was 36 months, but uh, we had an extension of one whole year. Uh, we had one of the biggest budgets ever funded by the Commission, 21.2.3 million euros in total, and uh, from those, uh, the 15 were funded by the Commission. We had 10 partners. Um, as we said, eFerry built on the Danish Green Ferry Vision project, which was an initiative uh, that uh, also received a SIP Efficiency Award. Uh, now, some words about the technical characteristics uh, of Ellen. It is a single-ended drive-through rural passenger ferry. Um, it can uh, transport 31 cars or four trucks and eight cars, 140, 47 passengers in winter, 196 passengers in summer. It has a length of uh, almost 60 meters and a breadth of uh, between 12.8 and 13.4 uh, meters. Uh, maximum speed of 14.2 uh, knots and uh, charging capability of uh, 4 megawatts. Uh, the dimensioning of the battery capacity and charging effect were based on uh, the goal, which was the operation on route up to 22 nautical miles. So this was uh, uh, the biggest, uh, the largest ra ra range uh, seen back then. Uh, the Ellen uh, has up to seven trips a day. Operating hours are, are from six o'clock in the morning to 12 at night. Uh, there is no backup and emergency generator. Uh, we have uh, two multiple for two uh, 400 kilowatts reserved at all times for emergency purposes. Uh, Ellen charges fully in the morning and uh, gradually diminishing uh, the capacity. Uh, so at the end of the day, we have a 30% of uh, the nominal capacity available. So it doesn't, uh, it's not 
at zero charging point uh, ever. Uh, so Ellen operates in, as we said, in Denmark. It uh, connects the island of Aru to two points of uh, the mainland in Denmark, uh, Finsav and Farborg. Uh, one route is uh, around 11 uh, nautical miles and the other one is uh, 10.5. So uh, with the range of 22 nautical miles being uh, 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 okay for Ellen, uh, Ellen can drive, uh, can operate back and forth to the island without being charged. Uh, here you can see a provisional timetable of uh, Ellen. Uh, we have onshore facilities in all three ports, uh, Sobe, Finsop, and Farbrook. Uh, all three ports are equipped with automated mooring system for faster docking and less free work. And uh, as we said, charging is possible only at the home port on the island uh, of Aro at the port of Sobe. We had a very extensive evaluation for Ellen. It was uh, done in four pillars, technical, environmental, uh, financial and social. So for the technical evaluation, uh, we had uh, we identified that Ellen can uh, travel with a very low average energy consumption per trip. Uh, we have available battery capacity of more than 3.8 megawatts, faster char fast charging. Uh, and all this leads us to the conclusion that uh, Ellen can uh, act as a valid commercial alternative to diesel and diesel electric ferries on uh, longer ferry routes and with higher frequency for daily connections. Now, regarding the environmental impact of Ellen, we have significant environmental savings compared to the best available technology and to the existing ferry operating right now. We have a decrease in all the, the polluting emissions. Uh, we have certified green electricity for Ellen's charging. And finally, uh, Ellen is entirely emission-free in a more global perspective. Coming to the financial evaluation, here you can see a table with the operational uh, costs for the for the ferry prototype for the ferry series uh, uh, compared to the new diesel electric ferry to a, a new diesel electric ferry and the existing diesel ferry. You can see that there is a very big difference between the operational cost for uh, Ellen and for the other two ferries. Um, these lower operational costs are due to lower energy costs, a lower crew cost. We have uh, no need for a marine engineer on board for various automations that are available on the ferry. Um, and finally, we found out that the higher investment costs can be compensated uh, in just around four to eight years of operation. Uh, so, um, all in all, we can say that uh, Ellen can get even more uh, efficient in terms of financial perspective uh, due to the fact that there is a constant decrease in battery systems. Uh, today, Ellen would cost uh, around 20% less. Uh, a very important issue that we need to discuss with uh, governments is that the charging systems need to be part of the infrastructure and not part of the investment that... Uh, operators need to make in order to buy uh, a ferry. Uh, and finally, standard, standardization efforts and economies of scale uh, assist us in making uh, electric ferries even cheaper. However, I need to note uh, right now that the, the evaluation of the ferry took place before the war in Ukraine, before the increase in, all, in almost everything. Uh, so these uh, figures that you see are based on the, the situation around 2020. Uh, however, uh, technology is being optimized, that is for sure. And I, I'm, I'm confident that uh, these target uh, figures will be achieved anyway. Now, from the passenger uh, perspective, uh, there is uh, an, an horizontal satisfaction with the ferry. Uh, the passengers were very enthusiastic about uh, the operation of Ellen. Uh, th they said that it is less noisy. Actually, it's not at all noisy, uh, completely smoke free. They were extremely satisfied with uh, safety, comfort and travel time. And the companies uh, that uh, participated in the building of uh, eFerry uh, said that they're expecting new jobs and new positions in their companies to be created due to the due to more e-fares being built.
Uh, we also had a, a business plan and uh, while formulating the business plan, we had a market uh, examination. So in order to identify the market potential on the, of the fair in Europe. So uh, we identified the routes that are up to 22 nautical miles and the vessels operating uh, in those routes right now. Identified those that are due for renewal now and the ones that will be uh, due for renewal in the next 10 years. And as you can see, there are a lot of ferries and there are a lot of routes uh, in which Ellen could operate. Uh, the same uh, was done for the world uh, market, for the Americas, Central Asia, Southeastern Asia, Pacific. So as you can see, uh, there are a, in total 125 routes in which Ellen could operate worldwide apart from Europe, I mean. And in the case that uh, the battery would be optimized to 36 nautical miles, to reach a range of 36 nautical miles, then we have another 45 routes. So uh, all in all, we can conclude that uh, eFerry uh, has a very good market potential in the future. So to conclude, uh, electric ferries like Ellen are a viable solution for standard routes, uh, trips of specific and known length. And finally, they are very good for ports located near residential areas or wild drive, wildlife areas, as they are not noisy at all and uh, smoke free, so they do not bother birds or any other animals that are in the area. So that's all for me. Here you can find uh, a very interesting uh, YouTube uh, video. Unfortunately, we don't have time to watch it right now, but I would like to urge everyone to watch it on your own time and I am available for any questions you may have. Thank you, Annie. Um, so you also have planned a little quiz question, uh, but we will first take uh, the questions that you have in case uh, we need to look at your slides to, to do that. Um, so let's see. Um, Agnes would like to know, uh, what do you think of kite sails for pulling boats like the Beyond the Sea Company? Can you can you repeat the question? Yeah, I don't know if you know about it. Uh, kite sails. Do you know about it for pulling yeah. boats? Yeah. Uh, she mentions the Beyond the Sea Company. What do you think about that? No, I'm not. I'm not. Aware You're not of familiar it. with it. Okay. Sorry. Fair enough. <laughs> um, Dominique Borch would like to know uh, for the Denmark case, uh, was it renewable uh, electricity that was used? Yeah. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Okay. Good. Um, the, and, the, the target of the island, and the, this is how it all started, is to be completely CO2 neutral by 2025. And this, I can say that this uh, target has already been achieved. So everything on the island is uh, from uh, renewable energy sources. There is no CO2 emissions on the island. OK, very good. Uh, you'll see there are some comments, very good presentations and some links in there. But uh, as for uh, questions, uh, Peter Crowley uh, asks if, is it correct that the e-ferry would be cheaper than a conventional equivalent ferry after only four to eight years? Do you know how has that changed with the most recent changes in fuel prices? You mentioned that though. Any news about uh, orders for more e ferries? If not, why not? Okay, uh, regarding the first question, um, it's not that it will be cheaper, it will be you know, the break even point will be when you combine operational costs that are much less for the e ferry. And of course, the investment is bigger in order to build an electric ferry, however. Uh, with the calculations that we made, uh, taking into consideration the figures that we had back then in 2020, uh, the e-ferry would be uh, cost efficient in the, in the sense that uh, we would have for 10 years less operational costs. So all in all, after the 10 years, we would be uh, we, we would have less money spent uh, including operational and investment costs. So, uh, Ellen, it's not it's not cheaper than a conventional diesel ferry, and probably it will never be. Uh, but it, uh, combining the operational cost, yes, it will be uh, cheaper. And also, this takes into consideration the potential change in the battery that may happen in the ten years time. So, 
uh, to be to put it very simply, an operator that buys an electric ferry will have some money left at the end of the 10 years uh, compared to buying a diesel uh, or a diesel electric ferry. Uh, now, uh, I have, we have not done any updates uh, taking into consideration the figures uh, that we have now, uh, you know, I mean, in regards to um, material we need for the battery and for the ferry. Uh, and we don't have any, any calculations with the new, new uh, fuel costs. And uh, this is actually something very difficult because this is a very new situation. But if Peter Crowley wants to fund a new project, we will be very happy <laughs> to undertake it. Uh, we are looking for such opportunities. Now, regarding the, the second question, uh, personally, I have had many inquiries from uh, people around the world uh, asking me to put them in contact with uh, the builder, the ship builder, who was uh, Heinrich. Uh, in uh, Denmark, and uh, last time I checked with him, he had received a few orders for new electric ferries. It was like ten or something like that. I don't. I'm not aware of what is uh, the case right now. Uh, whether these ferries are already ready or uh, they are in operation, but I'm sure that he has received orders. Yes. Peter, you wanted maybe to to say something. Yeah, just, just to say, um, so if you look at the capex is higher, I think that's clear for uh, electric ferries, but the opex is lower, uh, not just in terms of the electricity uh, that you use, but also in terms of the running costs, because it's a simpler system, the crewing is uh, different. I'm not sure that you need any uh, money. I think that the time is coming where these sorts of solutions are becoming uh, commercial already. You also have to factor in the charging infrastructure and, and this is not an insignificant cost also. Yeah, that is true. Um, and Annie, you mentioned the batteries. There was a question about that, uh, about the life uh, expectancy of the batteries. You mentioned 10 years. I don't know if it, if it is the, the life expectancy. Yeah, it's not actually life expectancy, but you know, as it goes in cars, in electric cars, uh, more or less, they say that in ten years uh, you have to change the battery, not because it's not good, because um, it kind of uh, reduces uh, the efficiency of the, the the efficiency of the battery is reduced, and this causes some problems, uh, and probably it will be best at this point to ch change the battery rather than uh, leave it to be completely useless. And you know, the, the next challenge, of course, not the next, the, uh, the current challenge is uh, the recycling of these batteries and uh, the next use of these batteries, because we're not talking only about recycling. Uh, we are talking about using these batteries somewhere else, for example, in phones or something like that. Mm -hmm. Indeed, okay. Um, so to conclude, uh, let's uh, see the question, the quiz question that we prepared on Slido. It's the final question on Slido. So if you want to contribute, it is now or never. What is the maximum range Ellen can achieve without being charged? Is it up to 18 nautical miles, up to 22? up to 24 or up to 30. And you'll have to be fast because we're running late. Okay. Very good. People have been paying attention overall. <laughs> so <laughs> thank you again, Annie. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, now I'll stop the sharing. So our uh,
final speaker can take the floor. We have with us uh, Frederick Thornell, uh, who is the co-founder of Green City Ferries, a company dedicated to efficient, sustainable uh, waterborne mobility. Um, he will speak again about uh, fuel cell hydrogen technologies, uh, notably the TECO project. So Frederick, thank you so much for being here. You have the floor. Hi, thank you. Thank you, Melissa. Uh, can you see my screen there? Uh, with yes, the... we can see it full screen. Perfect. Okay, uh, good. So, hi, everybody. I will try to make short because I think we're running a little bit late. Uh, but anyway, Frederick Tornell, I'm the co-founder of Green City Ferries. Um, we're, uh, we're, we have a little bit different approach. So just to explain a little bit the history behind the company, we started as from a battery company called the Shandia, also located in Sweden, who specialized in maritime uh, batteries for heavy duty applications. And that battery technology is LTO. In 2019, it was a switch. Um, we took out Green City Ferris from Shandia because we saw that two total different markets where Green City Ferris is focusing on the vessel itself and the Shandia was, is, uh, continued to be the battery development. Today, we're still working very close together. So anyway, what's happening with the Green City Ferries? We've been doing uh, quite big marketing research and, uh, uh, and we're trying to, uh, um, to develop the, the future need of cities. Right now, this last year, things are exploding all over the world, as you all know. Uh, it's an issue about how people are going to handle the, the growth in the city, the mobility, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So we try to tackle this with, uh, with our new vessel, which is called the Beluga. Uh, the Beluga, it's a foil assistant carbon fiber vessel. Uh, it's about high speed commuting in and around cities. So what, you, what we actually do is we're creating new opportunities for a, a new sustainable, attractive intermodality. We're not moving cars around, we're moving passengers and bikes, only that. And this we do in high speed with low wakes. So to give you an example, we in 30 knots, we do only 23 centimeters of wakes. And this is not, um, it's not a prototype, it's all based on market ready technology. Um, so, and this, we, we've been, uh, we talked earlier about, uh, with Annie about the lower cost of operation that it gives when going electric. So I'm gonna come back to this a little bit, but I'm gonna try to go a little bit fast. Anyway, uh, when we're talking about to, with cities, we we offering a premium vessel. We're offering the infrastructure around it. We are offering also making pre-studies like some something we started to that something it's called boat plan Stockholm. Uh, that was a private initiative, and we realized in Stockholm we have 62 vessels, uh, and uh, those vessels are using five percent of the energy that the region needs per year, but they emit 50 percent of the carbon dioxide from the region. 50 percent. Okay, so this is 15 million liters of diesel yearly, or 40,000 tons of CO2. About, uh, so you can clearly see that the waterborne mobility is the black sheep in every region, and every city is struggling with the same problem about this. So how do they do? So by combining this, making a pre-study with cities trying to come up with a good plan, a global plan, which is also what Peter talked about, the financing. This is super important uh, not to forget about. So uh, the financing could be that instead of peeping, people have to invest. Uh, when I talk about people, it's uh, regions, cities, operators. Uh, instead of investing, having new investment in new CapEx, they could lease it from us with uh, because there are many pension funds, et cetera, institutional fundings who are looking for investments in infrastructure. And new emission-free vessels are actually a new part of infrastructure. This has been a little bit a game changer. Historically, um, it has been, it is a showstopper for cities because the commuting, uh, either it's very polluting. So 
you have to understand that this is high speed. So when you go, for example, in a regular boat, uh, which is designed for five people, and then you put in five more people, it will not go fast. That's a simple fact. So when you go high speed in a large vessel, it's the same problem. When you're adding 10 tons of batteries and electrical inverters and the motors and all the electro stuff that you have to put in into the vessel, you get a problem, you get a weight problem. This is why we are using carbon fiber uh, instead of aluminum to build the vessel. We also have the foil assisted technology to lift up the vessel to minimize the, the friction and the wet surface, if we call it like that. So uh, a little bit to the on the vessel itself. This is where uh, putting the, it's a 147 passenger vessel, which is also moving about 30 bikes. It goes from 25 to 30 knots. Our sweet spot is eight, 28 knots. Uh, it's a DNV fully certified vessel. We deliver it in, in two versions. One is the R4 protected waterway version, which is in Stockholm and the R3, which is for higher seas, like in Greece or different cases we have without going into the details. Uh, but they both built on the same platform. Um, I, I, con I continue. So a little bit about the, the energy efficiency of the vessel. These are uh, competitors which are diesel driven. So when you're adding, those are high speed and normally you have a uh, like an exponential curve, which uh, goes up quite fast when you go up in speed. High speed is over 25 knots. So as you can see, our sweet spot is quite empty there in the 25 to 30 knot segment. Um, how do we start? Because we're a startup. We're, we're located in Sweden and our uh, the whole strategy is based upon like, we're going to start our own commercial routes in Stockholm. So we're actually putting two vessels into commercial traffic in Stockholm 2024. The first one is an electric battery driven for a short route, which is 60 nautical miles. Depending on battery technology, we can go up to 35 nautical miles in high speed. Uh, then we have the second project, which is our TECO EU funded project. It's a hydrogen vessel. It's a longer route. In this project, we are collaborating uh, with the green hydrogen production. So we actually have a windmill, which is on the island where we have uh, electrolyzer, which will come uh, to produce our own green hydrogen. It's about 220 kilos a day that we need. Uh, so it's two new fully certified, DNV certified vessels. Um, a little bit about what I said before, that this is innovation based about market-ready technology. So we have alliances with all our partners. So as you can see to the left one is a regular vessel, but it's a foil assisted vessel in Seattle that has been in, in traffic since several years. In the middle, we have the carbon fiber war vessel in Sweden that was built in the 90s. This is our in-house competence for the um, for the carbon fiber production. And on the right side, we have a sample of Damen, which is coming from our battery supplier, which is Eshandia, which was actually us before 2019. And a little bit the GCF right now, uh, we're located in Stockholm. We have our production facilities in Sweden, but we're also growing up where we have our closest collaborator also in the US and and New Zealand. And our production, we're aiming up on zero production standardization. We do our own shipyard. It's to basically to control the capacity, productivity, and the quality of the vessel. Um, and as well, in our team, we have, you can say, 100 years of experience within the team to, to make this work. So. As I said, again, it's all about market ready technology. It's all about zero production, but at the, the bottom line is that most cities, they have the same need. They are 70% of the cities are located next to the coastlines. They are located next to the water. They are growing. They have new 
transit oriented developments which are located outside the city? How can people move into the city without leaving the car in a nice and attractive way? Well, they need to do it fast. They need to do it without emission and they need to take their bike. So thank you, everybody. That was a little bit short. Uh, I tried to keep my 10 minutes. So Melissa, do you have any thank questions? Thank you so much, <laughs> Frederick, for trying to, to keep the time. Uh, yeah. Well, I think we can be over time for those that can stay maybe uh, 10 more minutes. Um, we don't have questions yet, but uh, maybe it will come. I do have a lot of questions because it was uh, very interesting. So uh, if people don't mind, uh, I will uh, ask you one or two. Um, that was my timing. <laughs> so um, yeah. first, yeah, I would I like <laughs> I would like to know. Uh, so you have a boat, a vessel that that is powered by uh, electricity only, and one by green hydrogen. So, did you reach any conclusion about that, or does it depend from the context, maybe? So we're actually building the first vessels right now. So this is in carbon fiber. So we're making a plug, we're making a mold in Sweden. So when with this mold, we, we then can produce a uh, hundred vessel. But if we're gonna speed up the scale up the production, more than four vessels a year, we're gonna go up to 16 in Sweden. Uh, we need four molds, of course, but okay. they're gonna go, but it's the same uh, platform for two, versions electric battery and electric hydrogen okay yeah um another question that i had uh so you mentioned uh and you need uh carmen is also saying that the financing through leasing is uh is very convenient uh and you mentioned that it could be very interesting for cities does it mean that you're also collaborating right now with several cities in europe already we have a prospect list of about 100 vessels Okay. And uh, we know no one will be the first one. That's why we need to build it ourselves. Or we need to start the operation ourselves. But most of them wants to have it after. So the, the prospect list is quite long. Uh, it's not just in Europe. It's uh, US is a big market. We have in the Middle East. We have in Australia. We have in New Zealand. We have in Asia. So the markets are everywhere. But the common factor, it's, it's cities. It's bigger operators who's working for cities. And as, as it was mentioned before, it's not up to the operator to make the infrastructure. And I totally agree with that. And cities, they also, most of the cases, they're wondering, how do we do this? So we, we are actually now working for the Åland government between Finland making a pre-study and about how to uh, put it uh, completely emission-free the whole a bigger plan for them and our beluga boat will cover one uh, part of that then we have to uh, for example ellen vessels are good for some cases and ours are good for other ones they're not competitors there's no vessel who can fit it all but we are in the fast high speed segment pass passenger segment hence the need for the pre-feasibility study to know what corresponds yeah to. yeah i mean it's it's an important it's also a door opener but it's also you have to start somewhere you have to start implementing and i think it's uh, most funding programs are also about innovation keep innovating when we have innovated something we innovate something new this is we need to start implementing the technology is there that's not the problem it is ready to be implemented now we have to come up with plan, also legal issues, how to go. And that's also the financing. Uh, if you need to, if you don't have the financing, sometimes you, the, city, the, the region or the country have to vote on a budget and it takes time. But if you can go through a leasing op opportunity with a possible buyout, you can have a faster implementation and transition. Okay, thank you, Frederick. Uh, anyway, uh, as mentioned, uh, participants will get the slide. There is your email there. So if there is any request to you, um, they can still uh, send it to you. Uh, now I would like just uh, to, work, to welcome uh, all speakers to maybe turn on the webcam uh, to ask a final general question that I have. Uh, also to thank you again for your participation and your time, both speakers and participants. It was certainly very interesting for me to have you today. I hope for participants as well. Uh, those who stayed until the end, I guess it has. Um, the general question that I have would be, uh, from what I heard today, uh, 
um, I was wondering, uh, we sometimes hear uh, generally in the field of energy and decarbonization and climate that we need this phase of uh, transition, you know, to decarbonize and we need transition fuels uh, and solutions. Um, do you think this applies to the maritime sector or do you think the solutions that that we have presented today, uh, we can directly go to fully green solutions, let's say. Um, if somebody would like to take the floor directly. Peter, I see your microphone is, is on. Um, so you're saying, uh, just to understand, Melissa, is it all right, uh, you know, do we need a transition or we, are yeah. we ready? Well, exactly. I think it depends on the application, actually. Um, I agree with uh, what was said before that for these shorter range and for ferries and uh, you know these commuter vessels that we've seen, yeah, they're ready to go. You know the technology is really ready. For some of the other solutions, if you're looking at large scale shipping, uh, long distance, then it's more challenging as issues relating to fuel supply and uh, and cost. Um, but uh, there's quite, you know, you'll see in the partnership that we have, this is really going up the TRLs closer to demonstration. You know, you've seen some of the projects presented here today. You know, they're real vessels operating in real conditions. And this is all about providing market confidence to make the decision to switch to these technologies which are different to what they're used to. Okay, thank you. Frédéric, would you like to complement? Yeah, I, I totally agree. The fact that you have the long range and then you have in and around the cities, it's two different things. The only common it's they're both on water, but in cities today, it has always been a showstopper for attractive and efficient commuting. People take the car. That's by default. It's a disaster in most cities. So let's, and, and, and it's actually new, for example, in the US, they define emission-free vessels as a part of the infrastructure. It's like the railway. Is it infrastructure? If you take away the train, the water is there. It's just clearly underdeveloped. Let's use it. It's no maintenance. This is true. Thank and you. automated uh, vessels as well is another thing that is growing yeah. and for these sort of waterways. It, yeah, we, we're, exactly. We're important, but not in high speed, maybe. <laughs> maybe not a high speed first. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but, yeah, but we're importing several projects using AI, for example, with mooring, how to be more efficient in, 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 uh, in docking. If you're saving two minutes per stop and you have 100 stop per day, I mean, that is... It's all about cost efficient commuting for the operator to have more routes per day. So it's about the, the, tra the travel time, it's important, but the runtime, the charging, our vessel is charging, for example, 1.5 minutes per nautical mile. So you, you have a 10 nautical mile route, then you charge in 15 minutes, but you, you can have that in several stops. You have to stop either way. So quick charging is key as well. Mm -hmm. Right, thank you for this interesting discussion. Uh, Angela, uh, any final uh, words? Well, on my side, I think my colleagues have perfectly described the, the situation. I think that the ports have the advantage of having a, obviously great a, transport communications, which can enable them to have the, those supplies um, easier than other facilities or entities. And I feel that the ports can start their decarbonization by parts, as we have seen on the hydrogen, uh, hi uh, hydrogen port uh, presented by Aurelio. Uh, they, they can reconvert some uh, uh, machines or some specific components that in other areas as are more integrated don't have such an um, um, uh, personal, uh, I mean, the ports have their, their own uh, management and they can 
uh, work uh, on their own more easier than than other buildings or facilities which are integrated and have to be communicated with the partners um, more frequently. So I think the the ports have some advantages to to be on the on the front of the energy transition. Thank you, Angela. Uh, then Aurelio, I, I guess you agree, but if you want to say something and then Annie will close. Sure, definitely. Uh, just to recall a figure that I think that is quite uh, breathtaking. The, the total amount of emissions related with the maritime industry is of the same order that and as a country as Japan. So the, the stakes are high. The, the challenge is there. And it's a pleasure to, to contribute to, to try to build that, uh, that figure. Annie, if you would like to say final words, you have the honor of closing this webinar. If you would like to. Okay, I think Annie has had enough. <laughs> and so, so have the others probably. Well, it was so interesting for me to, to hear from all of you. Uh, sorry, we went a bit uh, over time. Uh, just um, a final slide so you have my uh, contact information uh, but yeah thank you so much um, and uh, see you for the next uh, green island webinar maybe with uh, another organization uh, have a nice day everyone bye 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 bye